Today, August 26, marks the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, barring states from denying voting rights based on sex. While it is important to commemorate this milestone, we must also reflect on its shortcomings, for the movement failed to address the broad disenfranchisement of huge swaths of Americans, most notably Black Americans. As we reflect on this anniversary, it is essential that we study a new history of African American women's political lives in America. These women defied both racism and sexism to fight for the ballot and wielded political power to secure the equality and dignity of all persons. From the earliest days of the Republic to the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act and beyond, black women were the vanguard of women's rights, calling on America to realize its best ideals. I'm Martha Jones, and tonight we will explore this history as it is documented in my latest book, Vanguard. Through this discussion, we can remember the struggle around the 19th Amendment so that we can ask better questions about voting rights today. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ron Daniels, the president of Johns Hopkins University, and I'm delighted and honored to be here this evening with Martha Jones, Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor and Professor of History, uh, to discuss her latest book, Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All. Tonight's conversation, part of this year's Common Question programming, caps off a month of Hopkins at Home Conversations commemorating 100 years since the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution was ratified and celebrating the thousands of women across many decades who fought to make the vote, the right to vote rather, a reality. But as we will certainly discuss more in a few minutes, the fight for voting rights and equality under the law didn't end with the 19th Amendment, nor did it end with the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Indeed, in August of 1970, 50 years ago this month, Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman elected to the United States Congress, stood on the floor of the House of Representatives and reminded her audience that this struggle had been going on since the founding of the Republic, and it wasn't about to end anytime soon. In her remarks, she praised the founding fathers for articulating the ideal of equality but she chastised them for failing to realize that ideal in the United States Constitution, which she argued had enshrined a concept of democratic citizenship that was narrowly and exclusively defined as being white and male. Part of the reason for this failure, she said, was that there were no black founding fathers. There were no founding mothers. But she concluded, it is not too late to complete the work left undone. I really like that frame of uh, it, it not being too late to complete the work left undone. And as we celebrate the ratification of the 19th Amendment this year, certified, I should add, 100 years ago today, and the progress our society has made, symbolized by the recent nomination of Kamala Harris as the first African-American and Asian woman, Asian-American woman on a major party presidential ticket, we also recognize the work left undone in our collective quest to make our democracy more equitable for all people, to make our institutions more accessible to all people, and to make sure that every voice can be heard. As Daniel Allen so eloquently insists, the promise of equality announced in the Declaration of Independence is our common inheritance and patrimony, and it lies at the very core of our democracy. We know that democracy is stronger when it is more inclusive and when citizens are empowered to participate in it at every level. And in an election year, it is imperative that every single one of us participate to the fullest. Few understand the historical significance of this moment and the vital significance of democratic participation inclusion uh, for a collective life better than Dr. Martha Jones. Today, Professor Jones is a history professor here at Johns Hopkins. Uh, but before she entered the academy, she had a career as a public interest attorney, defending the rights of marginalized people in New York City. As I'm sure she would attest, the same values that animated her public interest work are evident in her amazing scholarship, her deep knowledge and understanding of social and legal history, her unyielding commitment to justice and representation, and her attentiveness to voices that are too often left out of the historical record. We see these qualities in all bound up together 
The Woman Question in African American Public Culture, 1830-1900, her study of Black women's diverse responses to women's rights. They are evident in Birthright Citizens, her award-winning account of how Black men and women in 19th century Baltimore fought for new understandings of citizenship. And now, once again, they are channeled through the sweeping history of Vanguard. Martha, thank you so much for joining me tonight and for doing your part to complete the work left undone. Now, before we kick off our conversation, I really would love it if you could just say a few words about yourself and about this quite extraordinary project that you've completed. Thanks very much, President Daniels. Um, thanks to you, thanks to everybody behind the scenes at Hopkins at Home for uh, bringing us together and uh, bringing us together on what is really an historic day in US history, 100 years since the 19th Amendment. I wrote a Vanguard um, very much inspired by what we all expected would be um, a lot of celebration, um, a lot of discussion generated by 100 years of the 19th Amendment. And at the same time, frankly, I was concerned that while I was part of a scholarly community that for three generations had been writing the history of African American women's politics, including um, the history of black women in the vote, um, I wasn't sure that that history would make it onto the main stage in this anniversary year. Um, so um, in many ways, um, I revisit um, familiar places, places like the convention at Seneca Falls in 1848 or the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Um, but I do so quite deliberately, um, standing in the shoes, um, adopting the lens of Black American women who not only build their own movement for political rights, um, but face a unique set of barriers, obstacles, and challenges um, as they too work to become fully um, American citizens um, for, in my story, um, nearly 200 years. So, um, so thanks again for the chance to talk about this work on this really auspicious day. Well, uh, thanks, Martha, for, uh, for that uh, quick overview and for a little bit of context around, uh, around the project. Do you want to just say something about the title of your book, Why Vanguard? And really just, you know, how did the woman that you studied for this project lead the way for our nation to become a more inclusive and more representative democracy? And if I could just at the risk of piling on here with too many questions, this is the old story of I asking one question with five unrelated subparts, but uh, forgive me. Um, but um, could you also just say something too about um, the role of family and just how you originally embarked upon this project in terms of understanding uh, your own background? So yeah. with that, over to you. Thank you. Um, I knew that when I started this research that I would um, be encountering many Black American women who were, as we often say, firsts, right? women who are breaking barriers, women who are shattering glass ceilings, all those metaphors that we use, the first American woman to speak in public about politics, um, the first black woman journalist, office holders, and a great deal more. So Vanguard certainly has that connotation. This is a story about many, many women who um, win the honorific of being the first. But as I began to piece those stories together, and had to ask myself, what stitches these women together, in fact? Um, or is this just a series of standalone biographies? Um, I began to recognize that there was a political philosophy um, that undergirded the work of the women I profile in Vanguard. And it is a philosophy that really has its origins in the earliest decades of the 19th century. It still resonates today. And that is that black women come to American politics through a critique, through a challenge that says, no race, no sex, no racism, no sexism, that the standard in American politics, the norm, the base should be um, a body politic, access to the vote, access to office holding, regardless of one's sex, regardless of one's color. And while to many ears, I think that sounds like a very 21st century 
ideal. It turns out in writing Vanguard, I discover for myself the ways in which this is a very old set of principles that black women lead us through, um, organize with, and really they set a very high bar um, for us in this country. We could say even sitting here in 2020, um, it's a bar we are still um, attempting to wholly um, meet, but it is the ideal nonetheless that the women of Vanguard set before us um, and have set before us for a very long time. Um, you asked me about family history and you know that um, I did something in this book that um, might to some readers appear to be, I think a bit unorthodox for a historian, which is that I start in my own voice and I start with my own family. Uh, but I'm someone who uh, works most days at home in an office where um, the portraits of my four mothers, my mother, my grandmother, great-grandmother, great-great-grandmother, even my great-great-great-grandmother, their portraits hang on the wall um, in my office. And above all else, I think I feel accountable to them um, in everything I do as a, as a historian. Uh, but I became a little, you know, more than a little self-conscious as I was finishing Vanguard that I actually didn't know their stories when it came to the vote. Um, I really uh, had missed the opportunity, frankly, to ask them about where they had been in 1920, what they had done, what it had been like. So I sort of took a detour uh, before I finished this book to try and recover them. Um, I follow my own grandmother in St. Louis, Missouri in 1920. I can't really find her in politics. Um, I follow her trail to North Carolina and Greensboro, um, a city um, fabled for the student sit-ins and the civil rights activism there in the 1960s. Um, and by 1926, she had moved there with her husband, David. Um, he was taking the presidency of Bennett College for Women, which is a black women's college in the city of Greensboro. And so I thought, well, let me look for her in the voting records of North Carolina. And when I got to the archives, it turns out nobody had saved those records. They were gone. Um, so I was disappointed and thought maybe I would never discover much about her at all in, on this question. And then I bumped into, fortunately, an interview that historian uh, at Duke, Bill Chafe, had done back in 1978. And Chafe had interviewed her about civil rights in okay. Greensboro for his own book. And when he does that, um, she tells us stories about the 1950s and 1960s and the young women at Bennett um, who um, are her students, her mentees, and are her heart, frankly, um, and how they go out in the modern civil rights era, door to door, getting black Americans in Greensboro to vote. What's the point? The point is that if I had stopped my book in 1920, in that year that the 19th Amendment was ratified, I would have missed my grandmother's story altogether because for her, I'm not sure where she was in 1920, but I know where she was in those years leading up to the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And it was in the trenches of voting rights, the essential work that black Americans did to get voting rights on the federal agenda. Um, she, in her interview, terms that work thrilling and it was thrilling for me to find her there. So, um... Martha, it'd be really good to talk a little bit about um, what the source is, other than the experiential basis that they had. What do you see as sort of the ur text or ur text that really led to the ideas? And again, to the extent that one of the things that you emphasized repeatedly was that the distinct position of um, African American woman is both. In, marginalized because of their gender and because of their race gave them a unique perspective, which you frame as a pan-humanitarian perspective. And so obviously being confronted with that degree of, in, you know, in contemporary parlance, that intersectionality of, of both uh, race and gender and the extent to which that um, had a significant limiting um, effect on the possibilities uh, for the woman that uh, you chronicle. Uh, it has to somehow also align with ideas that are out there and expectations. 
And I'm wondering, you know, when you look back at these stories, you know, to what extent do you see the inspiration as coming from um, the framing documents of the country and, and, uh, and the unfulfilled uh, realization of some of those ideas? To what extent are these ideas that are rooted in the church and in Christian theology? Um, where, does it, where do these ideas come from and how do you see them as fueling this narrative? The women I write about um, wrestle with those founding texts, um, the Declaration of Independence, the US Constitution. Um, they are good students of those documents, um, see their promise, um, but also, as you suggest, experience their disappointment. Um, even a constitution that is radically remade um, after the Civil War, three new amendments, um, the abolition of slavery, birthright citizenship, equality, due process, and then finally a 15th amendment that says race may not be a criteria through which you, you mediate voting rights. Um, there's a lot there. And still the women I write about do not find um, a firm enough foothold um, such that they can um, confidently and ambitiously um, organize and intervene. Um, one of the earliest um, of the 14th Amendment cases um, uh, involves Hall v. DeQueer um, in the 1870s, involves the case of a black woman who is um, excluded from a ladies' car in a steamship out of New Orleans. Josephine DeQueer. Um, fails at the U.S. Supreme Court in 18, 1872. Um, and it is a, a message to Black women that these venerable frameworks cannot quite see them. So I'm going to tell you my real answer to your question, which is um, uh, a book penned in 1892 by um, Anna Julia Cooper um, called A Voice from the South. And Anna Julia Cooper in 1892 writes a, a manifesto that is um, one part memoir, um, one part political theory, um, and a whole lot of deep reflection on the, on the lived experience of African-American women um, in our constitutional democracy. Um, and out of that comes a very clear articulation of this intersectionality principle that guides black women's politics. Um, out of that comes for me, um, a term that I don't associate with our founding documents, which is dignity. Right? She speaks very forthrightly. It's not only equality. It's, equality isn't quite enough. Dignity has a different tenor and, and it's a word she puts on the table and black women pick up. And then there is humanity. Um, and um, Cooper is adamant that um, when black women speak, um, when they engage in politics, when they test, American ideals, um, they do so not out of their own um, simple or modest interests, um, because they really believe that their capacities, um, their promise, their accomplishments are a measure of American democracy as a whole. Um, they very much think they're speaking about the interests of all humanity, um, not simply about black women or women or black Americans at all, but in fact, um, all Americans. And perhaps by the time we get to the 20th century, all of humanity really in a global sense have a stake in the kind of politics that Cooper imagines. Martha, do you, do you find when you look back at some of this writing um, and you think about some of the venerated uh, um, male African-American um, uh, leaders uh, throughout uh, the history of the United States, when you think of a, um, a Frederick Douglass, for instance, is, 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 is what uh, the contemporaries, the female contemporaries are saying, is it to you categorically different than what you see in the truly enlightened and um, stirring um, uh, uh, speeches and you know, the discourse of, of, of those men. You know, Douglas is a fascinating figure in this regard because 
Um, he's the only black American, for example, in 1848 at the fabled Seneca Falls meeting where women and some men produce a declaration of sentiments that includes a demand for the right to vote. Douglas is there and he is a, um, a strong ally to the women who uh, put forward those radical ideas um, back in the 1840s. Um, and he maintains that position. He is a women's rights man in many regards. Um, and at the same time, my read is that Douglas has a difficult time um, truly shifting his vantage point to ask what freedom, what citizenship, what equality, what dignity particularly mean for African-American women. And one of the places where I think he doesn't depart, but he just can't quite go there um, is to um, the uh, concerns of women like Anna Julia Cooper, but many others um, that relate um, disturbingly and unsettlingly to sexual violence and the role that sexual violence has played in the lives of enslaved women and formerly enslaved women in the United States, Douglas doesn't fully embrace that concern. Um, and while that doesn't put him wholly at odds with black women, it means that he doesn't see, for example, the gravity of what it means for a woman like Josephine to queer to be excluded from a lady's compartment, to be left on deck, to be left unattended in a corridor. For Josephine to queer, that is an indignity, yes, but that is also um, very dangerous. And this is something that Black women have to surface and build their political projects around uniquely. Um, they will win some male allies, but that will be a struggle, frankly. Um, as you think about, and we'll talk more about this later on, but you know, questions that have been left unanswered uh, from the work that you've done and things that you would like to be able to pursue, are, are there additional um, uh, ar archival materials that might be able to disclose more of the interplay between uh, the woman that you focus upon and their uh, their uh, African American male allies during this period is is are are there letters are there other um, artifacts that might illuminate that or are we left with what we've got now and this is the best you can do? Um, well, the good historian's answer is it depends. Um, it depends on what period. I think that um, for the nineteenth century, um, you know, Douglas's life and and his materials are well preserved, and and so are some of the major women figures. What was remarkable to me, and frankly new as someone who had worked for a long time in early America, was to move into the twentieth century and to um, realize what, why my colleagues spend so much time there because the materials are voluminous. And I spent a lot of time in the papers, for example, of the NAACP. Um, uh, I was interested in a woman um, who was on their board of directors and an activist um, named Frances Williams. And um, she is a regular correspondent with the men like Walter White, um, who head up the NAACP in those critical early decades of um, the legal challenge to Jim Crow. And these letters are spectacular because what I discover is a woman who is, um, you know, an intimate with these men in a, in a, in a colleague sense, um, very much understands herself to be an equal, um, familiar, overly familiar, chastising, and oftentimes directive. Um, here's a, here's a list of books you should read. Um, have you have you um, listened to so and so's remarks? And so um, you're right to point out that um, when we're lucky and we have those kinds of intimate, we learn the nicknames, right? We learn um, the ways in which these are folks who are mis mixing family um, with work, and and those kinds of relationships are very rich and multifaceted. Um, but I don't find as much of that in the 19th century, but we have a great deal of it in the 20th century and it's really exciting. So let me, uh, let me switch in another direction. We have a great student question that, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna draw on a few student questions uh, during the course of our discussion, but a, a, a question uh, from a student uh, who says, why do you think some of the women uh, you discuss in this book aren't as well known as others in the movement? 
Um, and, 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 you know, when I think even from that, uh, the students are also interested in knowing, you know, were some of the um, stories you uncovered and, the, and some of the personalities, were they really surprising to you? Um, was, you know, was, was, was this jarring? I, and I will just say on that note, for me, one of the things I, I learned a lot from the book, but one of the things that was really surprising to me, and it goes back to the conversation we just had a moment ago, were the number of women who preceded Rosa Parks and refused to cede their seat. And I hadn't realized that that was a pattern of defiance, principle defiance that goes back to the 19th century. That was, that was. Yeah. For a hundred years before Rosa Parks, um, black women are being um, Jim Crowed, um, that is, they're being um, sent to segregated parts of streetcars and railroads and steamships and more. Um, and um, if Rosa Parks was a um, sophisticated political agent when she dramatically um, does not give up her seat, for many women, this is a, a hard reality of everyday life as they travel for work, as they travel for politics, as they travel for family. Um, and I myself didn't realize how um, consistent a thread that was and how defining a thread that was, right? No political movement was complete for black women if it doesn't in some sense speak to this not only indignity, but as, as you know, um, the violence that black women encounter um, when they travel and they are Jim Crowed. Your bigger question to me was about um, why are these um, women less well known? Um, part of the answer is that um, there are some early women's rights advocates who, um, in essence, write their own history beginning in the 1880s. Susan Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton um, are behind the production of a six volume, um, 6,000 page um, series called The History of Women's Suffrage. And for a long time as historians, we relied on those books as the, the true, the complete history um, and uh, didn't question Stanton and Anthony and how it turns out they had been in writing this voluminous history had always been privileging themselves, their allies, their um, aspects of the movement. So for a historian like me, and I am preceded by um, the great Rosalind Turborg uh, Penn, um, Dr. Turborg Penn was at Morgan State University, one of our neighbors in Baltimore and really cracked the code on that book to reveal the black women who were there and the black women were left out. For me, the project was to go where black women were um, and not to look for them in places like Stanton and Anson, Anthony's history where they would not be um, and to read their texts, to read their letters, to read their memoirs and more and then ask, what are they thinking about? What are their ideas? What are they doing? Um, and then a new history does indeed emerge. And it turns out women's suffrage happens in anti-slavery societies. It happens in benevolent organizations. It happens in churches. It happens in civil rights organizations. It doesn't only happen in places that call themselves women's suffrage. So, you know, you know that really lends itself to um, a thought that I had as, uh, as I was uh, reading the book and, uh, and that is, um, to go back to de Tocqueville and, you know, the extent to which he talks about the uniqueness of America and in particular, the sense that there are all these uh, different places, both uh, secular and non-secular, in which you develop the muscle memory of citizenship. And so whether it's in small community organizations or whether it's in uh, churches uh, and, uh, and, and so forth, this is where the habits of citizenship are um, developed and, and then ultimately makes for more participatory and um, and constructive citizenship in the in the political sphere, and so you know this this translation of the struggles that went on, for instance, in the church and the struggle for ordination and so on, really set a precedent and develop um, techniques, alliances, argumentation that then carries forth very powerfully and naturally into the political sphere. And in that respect, it really is 
it, it takes its inspiration from Tocqueville, does it not? I think it's very Tocquevillian. Um, I use the phrase um, public culture to try and um, capture the diversity of spaces, of organizations, of rituals, of institutions that Black Americans build, right? It's in the early 19th century, um, because they are excluded from so much of civic life in the United States, um, that by the time we get to, for example, um, the Civil War um, and early Reconstruction, Black Americans have been at politics for a very long time. Um, we don't see them, again, if we look to the major political parties. We don't see them if we look to the state house. Um, but we, when we look, for example, in what was then referred to as the colored convention movement, uh, we recognize that black Americans are at the work of democracy, um, both because they have pressing issues that they both need to deliberate about and organize around, uh, but also because they are, if you will, performing democracy and their capacity right, to be um, whole partners in a democracy democracy and the conventions um, embody um, the, um, the skill, um, the savvy, the gamesmanship, all the things that go on in political deliberations are illustrated here. And in those conventions, women show up by the 1840s and say, we'd like a seat too. Um, and that then generates a whole series of debates about women's rights and how it fits into African-American public culture singular women really breaking barriers there um, and becoming um, central to the kinds of politics that Black Americans are building for themselves. Yeah, so, you know, so some time ago, I guess it's now almost uh, uh, two decades, Bob Putnam wrote uh, the book that got her a fair amount of attention, uh, Bowling Alone, and really talked about this retreat of Americans from civic life and doing a lot of uh, doing a lot of the work in community organizations and other kinds of places in which they again develop these habits of citizenship and so instead of connecting with working with others in common projects uh, that had a public spirit to them, people were spending more and more time on their own and 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 hence the title of the book was Bowling Alone because. Uh, the idea was that in the past people bowled in leagues and now if people bowl, they bowl um, in much smaller groups. Do you worry that when you think about this, this, this very powerful story of um, the way in which leadership was cultivated and first honed in the non-political sphere and, and ultimately uh, made itself felt very powerfully in the political sphere, do you worry that the drift away from these, these local engagements um, that we see today is limiting the proper continuous evolution and improvement in our civic life where we need people, we need our students who um, can take their energy and imagination into the political sphere, but we need them first and foremost to um, engage in these more close to home kind of organizations and activities. Do, do you worry about whether, whether we're losing something in this moment that you saw in centuries past for the woman whom you uh, chronicle? Um, yes and no. Um, no, in the sense that, um, you know, African-American women in this country um, still um, turn out at the polls um, disproportionately relative to other Americans. That the same networks that I, um, if you will, discover going back to the 19th century, um, church basements, YWCAs, women's clubs, civil rights organizations, sororities, alumni associations, teachers associations, these are still by and large the institutions that are through which black women organize and animate and get to the polls in numbers that do oftentimes exceed the numbers of their other counterparts in the body politic. So I, I frankly, um, in this particular election year, I've been suggesting to folks, um, you might wanna tune in to what 
black women are doing in their communities under um, unprecedented circumstances, understand how they are organizing, where they are coming together, because um, my sense is that they will um, continue to defy the statistical odds, even in 2020, um, even as it's necessary to invent new means. Um, but of course, those numbers are only impressive because, and this is the, the yes part, those numbers are only impressive because overall, um, the, uh, the numbers of Americans who come out um, on election day um, are, um, are dismally low, frankly. Um, and so um, uh, black women have discovered something and have sustained something, um, but, um, but the bar is not very high, unfortunately. So Martha, you know, the other text that we're considering this evening is the opening section of Danielle Allen's uh, magisterial 2014 book, Our Declaration. And, you know, one of the interesting things about her work is that it's in a different genre than your own and comes at questions of identity, equality, and citizenship from a different disciplinary angle. One of our students has a, uh, has a question about genre and she writes, Regarding history and storytelling, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the role of novels and poetry in shaping the public's understanding of racism. What kind of work can creative fiction continue to do in this new period of heightened activism? It's such a good question um, because it really is a key, I think, to understanding my field more broadly, African-American women's history. Um, our field is not one that emerged out of a social scientific um, historiographic tradition begun by uh, men in the 19th century and carried forward until today. Um, my field was begun by, um, by novelists and poets, um, black women and um, essayists like Anna Julia Cooper, whom I mentioned earlier. Um, they really are our first chroniclers, our first analysts, our first, first political philosophers. Um, so I would say the work I do just wouldn't be um, without them. Uh, to be more pointed, um, I'll say that um, like many people, um, Toni Morrison, um, her work, but her own um, approach to and, and uh, view about what literature is and how to write it has had a great uh, effect on me and I think many, many black women scholars of my generation because what Morrison insisted upon is that we come to the page, we come to the text, we come to the archive, um, always standing in the shoes of black women and telling the past, the present, and imagining the future from their vantage point. And so this book, while it certainly intersects with other histories of uh, women in the vote in the United States, as Black women intersected um, many, uh, many times and often with other communities of women, um, but there are chapters and stories and vantage points here that are uniquely um, those of Black American women. You've mentioned, we've mentioned a couple of times the centrality of church institutions um, to this story. Um, and so I think from Morrison, I learned, um, and, and my great teacher, Farah Jasmine Griffin um, at Columbia University, who um, really, um, insisted that I learn how to um, not get distracted by the archive, um, which is oftentimes built by people very far away from the subjects of my work um, and to stay rooted in their perspective. And the result, it turns out really is a different way of thinking about some fundamental questions that um, are essential to our democracy for all Americans, not simply for black women at all. Um, but I had to really stand in their shoes firmly in order to see that. So um, Martha, our conversation tonight concludes a month long series of events around the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, but uh, as uh, we know, the 19th Amendment was indeed in your words, only a brief pause in black women's struggle for voting rights. And in such, you've expressed some discomfort with the word suffrage. Um, can you say more about how you view the 19th Amendment and why suffrage feels inadequate as a descriptor when we consider the long arc of Black women's fight for recognition and equality under the law? 
it is because of the long arc. Um, the women I write about are thinking hard about their political rights, going all the way back to the first decades of the 19th century. Um, their struggles don't end in 1920 with ratification of the 19th Amendment at all. It's the beginning of a new movement for women's voting rights one that culminates in uh, passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. We could say it continues until today, figures like Stacey Abrams and her organization Fair Fight out there still working for um, universal voting rights in the United States in 2020. Um, so my increasing sense was that when we say women's suffrage, um, it sounds like a very delimited, um, very specific um, movement instead of questions, one that begins in Seneca Falls and ends with the 19th Amendment. Um, and it just wasn't big enough to contain the voting rights story that I wound up telling. But more to the point, it in a way, I think works to exceptionalize the story of women's votes and the road to the 19th Amendment from what we know about the broader history of the United States, which is that in every generation since the founding, we have struggled over the vote, who votes, by what means, by what terms. Um, the story of the 19th Amendment is one chapter, um, but it's not exceptional or somehow um, not connected with those other struggles. Um, because I'm writing about black women, I have to connect it to the story of the 15th Amendment, the disfranchisement of black Americans and suffrage began to feel um, like a, a bit of a straitjacket, frankly. Can I just, uh, before we conclude, you know, one of the things that um, I'd really love your thoughts on, and again, it's, it, it was raised in a few of the student questions uh, that uh, we received. Um, and that is just the interplay between those who are on the front lines of the equality struggle and so-called allies who uh, can or, or cannot, may not uh, align with, uh, with the equality seeking groups. And, you know, I, there's, there's, a, there's uh, an observation you make in the book where you say, you know, white American woman missed an you know, a chance at the beginning of the 20th century to say, we won't vote until black women can vote. So there, you know, there could have been a much more formidable and effective coalition that was built to, re to realize the full promise of uh, women's suffrage. Um, what do you think the best and the most respectful way for indirect stakeholders uh, to actively involve ourselves in an issue. And this is right from a student's uh, question. Um, the student says, I'm from South Korea, uh, yet I urge myself to learn and act on the uh, Black Lives uh, Matter movement uh, since as Dr. Martin Luther King uh, says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Yet I sometimes wonder if I'm in a place that I, I ought to be and, uh, and whether it's uh, inappropriate or appropriate to be there. So um, really would welcome your, your, your perspective on that issue. It's, it's a wonderful question because um, I do think that um, to do the work of social justice um, requires introspection, um, requires self-awareness, self-knowledge. Um, I think that's one piece. And so I think the question already tells us something about um, uh, the person who posed it in her capacity to um, engage in that kind of introspection. I think Vanguard is full of um, lots of examples of allyship, um, some that uh, were more successful than others, let's put it that way. Um, you know, in the abolitionist movement, Black and white women link arms at great risk um, in a very unpopular cause um, and push the needle forward on the battle against slavery in the United States. Um, and so I think for me, that is one example. Um, on the other hand, um, in the early decades of women's suffrage um, by the 1860s and 70s, um, there are lurking and sometimes right out in the open um, assumptions about hierarchy and who should go first and why. And that's another kind of cautionary tale. Um, the, the movement I hadn't been um, as familiar with until I wrote this book was that of the 
the years after the First World War, the movement for interracial cooperation. And I hope people will tune in to understand what it means to recalibrate and how here black and white Southerners um, are self-consciously deliberately um, with great effort trying to sit at the table as equals. Um, a lot of listening, a lot of pain and discomfort, um, but the, some of the women I write about are deeply moved when for the first time they sit at a table um, and their ideas are as relevant, forceful, uh, persuasive, um, and more um, in a, a radical political movement. So I think with each generation, there's a different story. We are living in our own in the era of Black Lives Matter. Um, but the point really is, I think that um, that commitment to equality, um, that commitment to listening, and that commitment to self-examination and introspection are all um, pieces, I think, when of the successful moments in Vanguard. So, you know, as, as we conclude, of course, I mean, this is a story about voting and the, uh, and the, and this, and the long path to, um, and in some sense, still not fully fulfilled promise of, of, of enfranchisement of, 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 Black woman, but indeed of uh, all Americans, irrespective of uh, of their backgrounds, to ensure that they're able to participate um, in this rudimentary act of citizenship, the vote. And we know, of course, that we're on the eve of a very consequential national election. And you know, I couldn't help uh, as I uh, as 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 I contemplate this interview. Uh, but to think about the very moving image that you um, describe and you also include in Vanguard of uh, Joella Moore, um, a black woman in her 50s in Mississippi, registering to vote for the first time in 1965, uh, following the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And it's not, as you note in the book, the first time she had tried to register, but the image is really striking and you reflect on it in truly stirring, very evocative terms. And I, I'm just wondering, you know, as um, we conclude this discussion and you think about what lessons you take from the indefatigable human spirit that drove uh, Joe Ella more uh, uh, forward. What um, you would want to say to our students about how they should think about their responsibilities in November and how we can properly honor that legacy. Joe Ella Moore, you're right. Um, you point out uh, seven times she tried to vote um, before she finally, um, federal officials come to Prentice, Mississippi and um, take over a motel and, uh, and invite her and other black um, local folks to come in and finally register. Um, what does that story tell us? It tells us, um, first of all, about tenacity, right? That um, she had to try the seventh time right, in order to um, succeed. Um, and so um, how do we um, manage disappointment? How do we manage when we're rebuffed, when our candidate doesn't succeed, um, when our platform is overlooked? Um, the lessons from Vanguard are about voting rights, political rights, influence is a long game in the United States. It is not a game of a season um, or even an election cycle. And the folks I write about make that very clear um, from their example. Um, but I think there's a lot of inspiration as well, which is to say um, it is not nothing, as we say, to be um, among those Americans who um, not only define, but hold us to our best ideals. That can be lonely work, um, that can be disappointing work, um, but it is essential work. And so um, I think the other thing about um, any election year is that there are sure to be those of us who are disappointed, um, whose candidates don't fare as well and more, um, but that's not the measure of um, our politics or that's not the measure of a democracy at all. Um, the measure, right, is what you do um, in the next cycle and the next um, and how you learn from that. And that's part of the story of the women of Vanguard is indeed how they build across time um, savvy, courage, 
strategies and tactics and more um, that I think we can say in the 21st century have really borne dividends. Um, but there are women who didn't live to see, for example, Senator Harris um, be nominated um, to the Democratic Party's ticket um, in 2020. Um, but I, for one, believe they are um, they're somewhere smiling um, for um, to see the fruits of their struggles um, born out here. I think that's a wonderful note, uh, very optimistic uh, note to uh, uh, to conclude on. And I just want to thank you for joining me in this conversation. It was uh, just wonderful spending time uh, being able to talk to you at a book that I thoroughly enjoyed. And I know that others will. Uh, congratulations again on the book that will be out this September. I encourage, of course, all of our students to uh, read it. And uh, of course, I uh, want to implore our students to find ways to engage in and be included in the extraordinary project of American democracy. But most importantly, and particularly this November, I think uh, Martha and I, I think we can speak uh, uh, clearly and passionately on this issue. You must this fall register and vote. You must vote. Um, it's imperative. Uh, and uh, with that, just want to thank you for uh, joining us uh, and, uh, and to say uh, to everyone, good night and um, look forward to being able to uh, continue this conversation with you, Martha, in the months and years to come. Thank you, Ron.